Good, mo good morning. Ah, we're so glad you're here. I wasn't surprised that you're here. I was just surprised that this thing is working, you know, like, all of a sudden. So, if you guys want to stand, uh, we're going to worship our great God this morning. This song, I'm sorry, I do that sometimes. So it's called Glorious Day. It may be a new song, it's new for here. Um, but this is one of my favorite songs of this year that I've learned. And it is about us not staying in the grave, uh, about God redeeming us. And so this is really a song to get excited about, even if you don't know the words. Um, listen to the words, sing along with us as we, as we learn it. And uh, I don't know, I think it's going to be a good time, time of worship. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. When you call my name. Yeah. 
praise Eager welcome Let our songs Be a sign We are here for you We are here for you Let your breath Come from heaven Fill our hearts with your life, we are here for you. We are here for you. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. welcome you here also. I want you to see if you can find somebody else you can welcome you don't know and say your name. Say something interesting about yourself. Let's get to know each other.
like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The wave of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so How he loves us. Sing that verse again, he's jealous. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and the sea. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory. Realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us all. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. thinking uh, this morning, you know, we sing a lot about God's love for us and how much He loves us. And that's true. He, he loves His people. Fiercely loves them. But this week, um, the youth and youth, they uh, did a Bible study, and one of the things they talked about was the fact that from Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, to Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, there's about 400 years where God was silent with His people. 
The reason that God was silent with his people was because he had tired of them. You think back in the Old Testament and how um, God would do everything he could for them and then they would turn away to false gods. They would turn away from worshiping him. They would do something else, the, the next best thing. And then he would uh, have to go after them and then they would come back to God and they would serve God faithfully for a time. And then they would do it again. And this went on throughout all of the Old Testament. When we get to the book of Malachi, what we see is this idea that um, the prophet says, hey, God is weary. God is weary of dealing with you. He loves you, and he has tried with you, and he has come after you, and he has sought you out, and you continue to weary him. You continue to make him tired. Jerry and I were talking about this that this week, and she was sharing with me what she was going to talk about. I thought, you know, we, we have these great worship services, and we have opportunity to pray and and we want to see God move, and we want Him to do things for us, but ultimately I, I wondered, is God just weary of us? Does He get tired of the fact that we know what to do, and we don't do it? Does He get tired of the fact that I mess up, and I have to keep going back? God, I'm sorry, forgive me, I no, I shouldn't have done what I did. You know, is he, is he tired of that? I have to say, probably so. I, mean, I would be, wouldn't you? If you tell somebody something over and over again, and they keep, I mean, don't you get tired of having to tell them the same thing over and over? Luckily for us, God hasn't spent four hundred years of silence since then. We have His Word; it's perfect and complete. I thought maybe today we need to spend a few moments just simply saying, God, don't get weary of us. Please hear us. Please pour out your spirit on us. Don't get weary of us. So this morning, um, I don't know, you, you may have a lot of burdens and hurts in your mind and your heart. And if you do, then man, this is the opportunity to lay that at the feet of Jesus. Maybe today you're like me and, and you just say, God, I, the stuff I want to do, I don't do. And the stuff I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. And I'm sure you're tired of that. Forgive us for making you weary. Forgive us for just making you tired. And in spite of our silliness, in spite of our lack of commitment, don't get tired of us. Pour out your spirit on us. If you would want to join me in praying that prayer, then I'm going to give you the opportunity to come up to stand up here. If you need to pray for something else, we have places for you to kneel and pray. But as we stand together and bow to pray, if you want to come forward, you come now. Let's, let's stand together and pray. God, as we come before you, God, we know that we wear you out sometimes. You just get tired of continually having to draw us back after we get off track. God, today we ask that you just don't weary of us. Help us to have a commitment and a faith in you that spurs us on to obedience and holiness, right living before you. God, today we ask that you put aside everything that we've done this week and the ways that we have walked away, failed, and not done what we're supposed to do. You just, God, don't weary of us. Put it aside and pour out your spirit on this place today like never before. God, we need you. We need you to transform and change lives. We need you to take away the hurt. We need you to heal. We need you to give peace and comfort to those of us who are struggling today. We ask, God, that you do that. You're the only one who can. And our faith and our hope is in you and you alone, and we give you glory. We give you glory for everything that you've done because you 
God, are great. And we worship you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Pour out our praise to you, oh, sing it again. 
may be seated. Hey, take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Um, we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 25 today. 17 through 25. Um, last week we talked about the fact that um, Paul uses the two pinnacles of the Jewish faith for them, Abraham and David, to show them that even Abraham, even David were not justified by their works alone, by the things they did, by their own righteousness. Even Abraham and David needed, right, needed God's righteousness. They needed faith to be made right with God. And the only way that we can be found right with God is not in anything we do. There is nothing that we can do. There is nothing that we can do to be made right with God apart from the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Cross, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and our uh, acceptance of that free gift is what makes us right with God. There is nothing we can do. You can't get to the end of your life and hope that your good outweighs your bad. It'll never happen. Never happen. Because one thing the Bible says that we do separates us from God. One sin separates us from God. And we cannot do it on our own. And that's what Paul is trying to tell him. And now, today, Paul takes that a step further, and he shows why Abraham's faith was so strong. Why? And so, um, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, 17 through 25. I'm going to read it, and you follow along with me. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence. Wait a second. Pause. Let's read that. In the presence of the God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. Right? In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distress made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. The words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but, also, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Amen? That's right. Listen, that's awesome. So I want you to stop and think today. I want you to stop and think of something you would like to see happen in your life. Okay, I'm going to give you a second. Stop and think about something you would like to see happen in your life. Listen, that is impossible. There's got to be something going on in your life right now that you would love to see God do, but you know deep down inside it's impossible. Like, there's just no way. I would love for this to happen, but it is simply impossible. I looked it up uh, this week. The oldest birth mother in the United States of America was three days shy of 57 years old. Now, some of you ladies are going, uh-uh, not in a million, zillion, trillion years. There was a lady somewhere overseas, I think India, who was 70 when she had a child. 70. And that is the oldest, what we, I guess, recorded, uh, other than the Scripture, which we know uh, is not the oldest, because Sarah was uh, really old, and so was Abraham. When Isaac was born to them. Now remember, Abraham, the father of many nations. So you can imagine his surprise. He, 
had not been able, they had not been able to conceive. He was getting older. Sarah was older. And there was no way physically it was impossible for them to have a child. But God comes to Abraham and says, hey, have no fear. You're going to be a father. And that is going to be the beginning. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, right? That's, wait a second, what? You're going to, I mean, I, I just wanted one. I'm going to have all these offspring. Yeah, you're going to, your descendants will be all, it will be numerous. And Abraham laughed a little bit at that, at the physical impossibility of that. And God said, what are you laughing about? And in that moment, Abraham made the choice. He made the decision to say, you know what? You're God, and I trust you. I believe you. And then later on, God comes and sits down with him at a fire and tells him, listen, what I told you is true. In a year, you're going to do this. And Sarah overhears, and she laughs to herself because she knows the physical human impossibility of it. God says, listen, what are you laughing for? I can do anything. And their faith, they believe that God is who he says he is, and he would do what he said he would do. And Abraham is a hundred years old. Isaac is born to him. I think we look at sometimes the scripture like that and we just go, yeah, but that's the Bible. These are human beings that we're talking about, right? This is a physical impossibility. Up until this point, this is a hopeless situation that Abraham finds himself in and having an offspring. No way, right? But Abraham believed that God was who he says he was. And so Paul here in Romans chapter 4 takes this opportunity to say, let's talk about faith. Let's talk about the kind of faith. Listen, the faith that Abraham had in God, that God said, that's righteousness. That's such a deep faith that that is righteousness. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want that kind of faith, right? I want to I want to have the kind of faith that God looks down and goes, "Man, now that's something I can get behind." Right? There, right? That's something I can get behind right there. And so what the first thing we need to notice in this passage and we read it in verse 17 is the focus of Abraham's faith. Now we that if we're if we're not careful what we do with that is we go, "Well, yeah, of course we know the focus of every, the focus of everybody's faith, right? Is is God that's what verse 17 says. His focus was on God alone. Now, that seems kind of like a, just an automatic, yeah, of course. But if, you, if you're not careful, you, you miss it, right? Because for us, it is paramount that we get the importance of the focus of our faith being on God. Great faith. Listen, great faith. No matter how vital your faith may be, it will never benefit us if our focus is on the wrong thing. You can have all the faith in the world, but if your focus is misplaced, if your focus is not completely on God, then it's not going to benefit you at all. You say, well, of course, we know that, but if we know that, why then do we put our faith so many times in other things than God. Abraham's faith was completely focused on God. If you even have weak faith, remember in the New Testament, you said, if you have the faith of a little mustard seed, what can you do? Look at your neighbor and say, move mountains. All right, y'all are y'all going to have to wake up, right? I, I don't want to have to come out there. I will. Don't make, me come, don't make me come back there, right? That's what we say. No, listen, if you have just a little bit of faith. So, so here's what he's, Paul is saying. Listen, even weak faith, if it's placed and the focus is on a big God, you're going to be okay. Even, a little, even weak faith. But if you, can, if you have great faith, faith that you think is just the most vital, man, you telling people, I got faith and I got faith to spare, but it's focused on the wrong thing. Then you know what happens? You're not going to survive. It's not going to be beneficial for anybody. But look, the difference, though, is big God, little God, right? That's, that's a big difference. People who have faith in a little God or people who have uh, a lot of faith in the wrong thing, what they're doing is they're saying, listen, I, I have faith 
in God up to a point. I think God can do a lot of things, but listen, God's not super active in our lives. God doesn't sit back and get involved in our lives, but big God faith says God can do anything. He is who he says he is, and when he can do anything, listen, all I got to do is trust in him. I put my faith in him, and he can do anything. Do you know the reason that I don't think we, that I think we don't see God do more stuff? Because we really don't believe that he will or that he can. Let's be honest. Let's just be honest. There's doubt. I, I want to pray for healing. I want to pray for this situation to, to change. I want to pray, pray for my marriage to be restored. I want to pray for my everything. I want to pray for my kids to do something special. I want to do all these things. But when we get right down to it, we don't pray for those things. Because really, in the back of our mind, there's a little bit of doubt. We kind of have this um, little God syndrome. I'm really not sure how much God wants to do. He created you. He loves you. He wants to do everything for you. That was the point with Abraham. And Abraham had to trust God. And so Paul says, listen, there's a... In, in verse 17, he says, God, Abraham believed God could create nothing something from nothing, right? God could do that. Maybe this is a reference to um, God's restoration of Abraham's and Sarah's ability to have a child. Like, he literally created Isaac from nothing. There was nothing to create it from because there was no, physically it was impossible. And Abraham had faith that even God could create something from nothing, and he did. God gives life to the dead. Abraham believed in God's resurrection power. And here's the important part. Listen, it proved out, not just in that moment when he was telling him you're going to have an offspring, it bared it out all through Abraham's life. Abraham proved himself again because remember when Isaac gets a little bit older, this promised child, the one that Abraham and Sarah couldn't have, and then they have, and he gets a little bit older, and God says, hey, I want you to take him and sacrifice I want you to take him and sacrifice And here's what happened. Abraham said, wait a second, God. This is your pro you, you promised me this child. Now I've got this child. Now you're telling me to sacrifice this child? I'm not going to do it because that doesn't make sense to me. No. He took Isaac. But what do we do? God, I think you're telling me to quit my job, but God, I can't quit my job because that doesn't make sense to me. Why would you tell me to quit my job? It doesn't make sense, so I can't do what you say because it doesn't make sense to me. God, I know what you want me to do in this situation, but it just doesn't make sense to me. I can't do it in that situation, so I'm not going to do it because it doesn't make sense. God, I want you to intervene in this area of my life, but what you're telling me to do is, doesn't make sense, so I'm not going to do it. And then we look around and go, I wonder why God doesn't do more in my life. God says, hey, I'm trying to tell you what to do, but you won't do it because it doesn't make sense. And Abraham knew this. The God who created something from nothing is telling me to do something, and I'm going to follow him. Because my faith is not in what I understand. My faith is not what I can see. My faith is in not all the stuff around me. My faith is in God. My faith is in the God who did something from nothing. So I'm going to take Isaac and I'm going to do what God asked. And he gets him and he puts him on the altar and he raises up the knife to sacrifice him. And God says, no, I just wanted to know if you have the faith to go through with it. I don't want you to sacrifice. But see, here's what we forget. We go, could he have done it? Could he have really killed his only son? Yes, because you know what he believed in? A God who brings life to the dead. A God, he knew if God tells me to do it, God brought him from nothing once, he can do it again. Because I trust in him. I don't trust in what I understand. Listen, how many of us trust in what we understand? And not in who God is. And then we go, God, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing more in my life? Why aren't you answering prayers? And God's going, because you really don't trust me. You really don't. Abraham believed in a big God. How big is your God? How big is your God? How big is the God you believe in? 
Are you believing in a big God or are you believing in a little God? A little God that, you know, he'll do some stuff if we really, but in the vast scheme of things, not going to do much. I don't know about you, but I want to believe in a big God. I want my faith to grow. I want to be able to look up one day and go, man, I am, I am doing everything because my focus is where it needs to be and God is hearing me and God is answering because, I'm, because he loves me so much and he is pleased with my faith. But Abraham's faith faced a lot of challenges. We talked about it a little bit, but first, it's just a physical impossibility, right? That, that's the first challenge. Abraham had to believe God even in the face of physical impossibility, physical limitation. He had to believe that God was going to do what he said he was going to do in the face of all that. But second, he had to overcome this idea that it was too good to be true. That his faith was too good to be true. That what God was telling him was too good to be true. He had to overcome that. Because, listen, if God tells you, you're going to be the father of a great nation. You're, I'm going to make you, your descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. Right? And you go, that's what I've longed for. I, I wanted one offspring. You're going to do this for me? That is more than I can. It's too good to be true. And sometimes in our lives... We don't ask God for things because we go, well, I don't deserve that. I don't. But God is all about giving us more than we ever could imagine. But we've got to have faith and we've got to start somewhere and we've got to say, listen, I, I want to believe that you are who you said you are. When we are faced with challenges to our faith, what do we do? What do we believe God for? You know here at Crossroads, listen, we started on faith. <laughs> I mean, we didn't have a building. We didn't have a place to meet. We, it, really, it was me and Jerry, and at the very, very beginning, it was me and Jerry, right, and a couple of people that said, hey, you know what, we need a, we need a campus here. We need a place to worship here in DeSoto County. And I know people said we were crazy because they said, there's churches everywhere. Why? We don't want to be like everybody else. We want to be different. And we started having some meetings in some different places. I think the very first meeting was at the, which doesn't even exist anymore, it's gone, is the, it was a little side room at Memphis Pizza Cafe in South Haven. That was our very first meeting. We met at the library in Hernando one time. We met at Derek and Kathy Chandler's driveway one time. I mean, we, anywhere we could gather some people together and say, hey, this is our vision. And it was faith. We didn't know. And two years later, we're standing here and we're going, man, we're out of space. What are we going to do? Well, you know what? We're going to have faith. We have property paid for, but we're going to have faith that God is going to do what God wants to do with this place. We're going to have faith. What do you believe in God for? Maybe you don't have a promise from God about what God wants to do in you and through you because you already let doubt in your mind for far too long. Why would God tell you what he wants you to do when you, you're not even going to believe him when he tells you? Look. Sometimes maybe I get too real. Because some people want to think their pastor is perfect. Well, you're in the wrong church. That's the case. Look, I struggle with that. Right? I struggle with the fact that, man, what does God want to do here? And maybe God's not telling us where, we want it, where he wants us to go because we really have some doubt about what's he going to do. Instead of putting all our faith in God, you are who you said you are. You brought us this far. You're not going to let us down. We don't care what you do as long as you do it. And it's your will for us. Because if we make it, if we figure it out, if we work it out, it is not going to be what it needs to be. Right? It's just not. Have we made mistakes along the way in two years? <laughs> yeah, we have. But I think the reason that God has blessed us is because ultimately we just want to do what he wants us to do. We don't want to be some fake, plastic you know, place where people can't come in and go, man, I had a terrible week. It's okay to say you had a terrible week. We want to be able to have a place where people come in and go, man, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. My 
packed yesterday. I don't like packing dishes, by the way. Anybody's really good at it wants to volunteer. Um, right? But maybe God's not given us a promise of what He wants to do in our lives personally because for far too long we've let doubt in. And we've already given up on God doing great things in and through us. Listen, we've given up. Well, my life has not been what it needed to be. I haven't done what I needed to do. I've wasted a lot of my life. God's never going to use me. God's never going to do great things through me. I had my opportunity. I blew it. God's not. Listen, that is a lie from hell if you believe that. You've already given up. Stop giving up on what God wants to do in your life and start believing that God can do anything. He can bring something from nothing. If He can bring something from nothing, can He not take your life and do something great in and through you? If you just say, God, I believe in you and I trust you and I'm going to let you lead and guide my life, of course He can. Of course He can. Abraham got to this place because he saw the human impossibility of becoming a father versus the divine possibility of, go- of God going back on his word. That's where he came to. Okay, I see the human impossibility, and I know what God has said. What is greater, God doing what he says he's going to do or God going back on his word? No, it's the, the, the safe, sure bet is God's going to do what he said he's going to do. God's not going to go back on his promise. And he decided... If I put my faith in God, He will do the impossible. See, the problem is we don't really believe God will do the impossible. Not really, if we're honest. Because what we want to do is we want to trust God in the stuff that... the, The scripture we read said it. He hoped against all hope. Meaning what? He put all the human hope aside and said, my hope is not in humanity. My hope is not in the stuff I can see. My hope is not in the stuff that I know. My hope is in God, the one I can't see, but I know he is who he says he is. He will do what he says he's going to do, and I will put my hope and my trust in that. Look, for all our lip service about trust in God, we rely mainly on what we can do ourselves. We give a lot of lip service about how much we trust God and we get up here on Sunday morning and we sing, great are you, Lord, and oh, how he loves. And, you know, I ran out of that grave. And I think what happens with our faith is we run out of that grave and the first thing that happens, we run back in. God does not want us to do that. He doesn't want us to give lip service. He wants us to truly, we do, we give lip service about trusting God, but We only deal with what we can do ourselves. Why? Because we really serve a little God. If we're going to serve a big God, you know what it means? It means we've got to stop just saying it. We've got to really do it. We've got to say, I serve a big God. And so, what Paul is telling them is this. First of all, look at the focus of Abraham's faith, and then look at how he handled the challenges of his faith. But then you also got to look at the point of the faith for Abraham. Why was Paul talking about Abraham? What was the point? Well, first, for uh, it was Abraham's faith, the point was to glorify God. God is never glorified by us apart from faith in Him. So if we think I can do something on my own and God's going to get glory for it, He won't. Because you get glory for that. The only way God gets glory is by our faith in Him shining back through us. He gets glory from that. Abraham, he had tremendous faith. And God got tremendous glory. Abraham's faith was great, not because it was so strong, even though it was strong, but Abraham's faith was great because his focus and the way he faced challenges was was to rely on God. That's why his faith was so great. That's why he's remembered. That's why we are talking about him today. And second, not only did Abraham have faith because he was wanting to bring glory to God, it was was faith that brought righteousness. And verse 22 tells us that. Faith is the only way anyone will ever be righteous before God. Faith. And we want our faith to grow. That's why, look, 
That's why we're going through the book of Romans. Because it'll help us grow deep roots and our faith grows stronger. We, we could come in here and I could, every Sunday, man, I could get you pumped up like a pep rally and send you out. But you know what happens on Tuesday when life hits you in the face? That's, gonna, that's, gonna, that's not going to last very long. Deep faith helps us to handle the challenges of life. That's why we do that. So what are we to believe then? So Paul tells us this. Put your faith in the one who raised Christ from the dead for our sins and was resurrected for our justification. Put your faith in the one that Jesus went to the cross and died. He was put in the tomb and God raised him from the dead. It reiterates all the way back through. Our faith is in the one who can raise the dead. Our faith is in the one that can do more than we ever hope or think. Our faith is put in the one who can do things that we only dare to dream about. And remember back to the very beginning? What is it that you want to see God do that you think is impossible? What needs to happen in your life that is impossible? Why do you doubt it? Why do you doubt it? Because I can't do it myself serving a little guy. And I don't know about you, but it's time that we started serving a big guy. It's time that we say, God, I can't do this, but I don't have to. You can. You can, and I trust you. So first, make God your focus. The only one who gives life. Make that your focus. My faith is not on the things I can see. My faith is not in the things I can trust or do myself. My faith is in the only one who gives life. He brought Jesus back from the dead, and he gives us life eternal. Face the challenges of your faith by thinking through the human side. You've got you to gotta do that, right? Let's be realistic. Think through the human side, but ultimately trusting with God, nothing is impossible. Humanly speaking, it may not make sense doesn't have to make sense because God can do the impossible. And finally, God glorify God through faith. You will be able to bring glory and honor. Look, it boils down to this. No matter how long we've been in church, no matter how many times we've said with our mouth we trust God, we have to make the decision that I am going to put my faith in a God bigger than myself. Whether it's for salvation for the very first time, something out there bigger than me, I've got to put my faith in that, or whether we've just been kind of you're surviving along serving this little God, and today God wants you to say, you, you can do anything. You are the God of the impossible. You are the God that can do anything. Nothing is too big for you, God. Nothing. Do we really believe that? Or do we still have a faith that says, eh, only what I can figure out. Only what I can understand. Only what I can see. If we're going to be the, the kind of church that God wants us to be, we're all going to have to get to the place where we say, God, you are bigger than that. You can do anything. And we trust in you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for today. And God, we just ask that um, you help us, God. I ask that you help me because, I, God, I, I need to have more faith. I need to trust you more. I need to rely on you more. I need to do more. And God, I know that, that you love us. and God, I know that the people in this room love you. But God, I don't want to serve a little God, and I don't think they do either. Help us to serve you, to have faith in you, to trust in you. And God, I know there's something in our heart right now that we've longed for, but we just thought it was impossible. And I pray, God, that we would lay it at your feet and trust you. It's in your name we pray. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. And as we do, if you need to come and pray, there's uh, altar benches you can kneel at. Come and pray. If you want to go and pray with someone, there'll be some people in the back that you can grab and pray back there. If you want to come and unite with Crossroads.